Uh, good morning. Welcome to Sunrise Daily Today. I'm Train Belenuso here in Abuja. Good morning. I'm Mal Kwelgu, Yusuf, sitting right beside Chamberlain <laughs> here in Abuja as well. And hundreds of kilometers away, I'm Kairo Kikilu. Welcome to Lagos. And from Lagos, good morning and welcome to Sunrise Daily. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. And it's good to see you, Chamberlain and Malpe. Indeed. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you both as well. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of concern being raised now about security. Yes, the all-important security measure, the strategy, whatever it is, however we describe it. But the thing is, yes, we've talked about security in the scheme of things as the country progresses. Much as yet the year is winding down, but we know we're looking forward to general elections. We also know how security is a huge component in that mix for businesses to thrive, for the economy to go ahead. Because, I mean, you know what they say about uh, capital being a coward and fleeing when it's threatened with insecurity. But several issues raised, I mean, huge concerns for us this morning. Uh, in, from a Boeing state, for instance, we do know that uh, at much later, some violence that broke out in the states, which had to do with the APC chairman and um, another member who was aspiring for a political office, they're just fighting for political dominance. The police did release a statement that they were trying to keep uh, some of those key persons in protective custody, some narrative like that. Much later, the governor then came through and said they needed to arrest the APC chairman in the state and the gentleman who was contesting for the House of Reps because they were the key actors in the killing of three persons, including a policeman in that state. So political violence is something we don't want to even see raise its ugly head. And when it does, it should be arrested, addressed, no matter whose ox is God. And then, as though we had heard the last of kidnapping, remember when all those things about the currency coming through, all of those narratives about ensuring kidnappers or kidnapping becomes history in this country, one ugly incident played out and was largely reported yesterday as well on uh, several bulletins that we had. In Taraba State, three siblings, three siblings were killed. Now, they had been kidnapped uh, by, of course, the kidnappers. And then they demanded, guess what? A hundred million naira ransom, as though these things dropped from the sky. Their father is a Katu uh, They negotiated, they agreed for 60 million. The kidnappers insisted it must be dropped in cash. Then there was a bike rider who was the runner, delivered the money, and he was killed. So three siblings and the bike rider killed. And as though that's not enough already, uh, not to add to the unfortunate incident that is also making the rounds about, remember the lady who was killed in Lagos, the lawyer? So you just sit back and you look at all of these things and there are huge questions concerning what really is going on? Why do these things almost just seem to happen with reckless abandon? Is it because these people think that they can do all of these things? So there is a lot of question about security. Yes, we know that the president has said time and again how he intends to ensure that elections are credible. But if we don't do something about security, if, those, if they don't know or if we don't see very stern punitive measures against them, they will keep thinking they can walk away with this. The president has given several directives concerning kidnapping. Why is this still happening? There are just several questions, really, that, that's going on, and this thing's need to stop. So many um, incidences to wrap our heads around Chamberlain. Uh, too yeah. many of them. I mean, you've just enumerated a few. I could add a few more. Um, talking about an incident in uh, Ibadan where bodies were found yeah. and body parts removed, <clears throat> suspected uh, either ritual killings or uh, people who are harvesting organs uh, for sale because there's also a thriving business in that area. Uh, then you also have in Lagos, I think some bodies showing up in a canal somewhere, uh, you know, only I think Kirikiri Canal. So, I mean, there's so many incidences here and there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of these things happen because they know that they can get away with it. They know that, um, you know, nothing is going to happen. We pretty much can commit the crime. And, you know, it, it, very little investigation, if at all any, you know, is going to happen. 
because they know that the people who should be in charge of investigation are generally under-resourced, under-trained, are ill-motivated, um, and generally our legal system, eventually even when people are arrested, the system is so tough that um, you know, people really get to face the punishment or face the, the, the time for what it is that they should have done. Just a few days ago, we had uh, the Catholic Bishop of Yola Diocese visiting prisons and asking that something be done to you know, check, check the fate of awaiting trial inmates, some of them who have been there for over five years uh, and more. Now, this is not to discountenance the work of those, because only yesterday as well, while we were talking about uh, Mrs. Bolale Rahim's murder, we also uh, you know, were shown the picture of a man uh, who was arrested for killing his 48-year-old yeah. lover um, here mm -hmm. in Abuja. So in some instances, um, the, the, the police are able to do their work, but oftentimes those instances are few and far between. Majority of incidences go on, unchecked. I mean, in the impunity with which they're committed tells it all. But I don't think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think that as a country we should give up. I don't think that what we need to do is to throw our hands up in the air and say, oh, there's very little that we can do about this. The question is, these are the things that are challenging our state or the issue, this is the, these are the things that are challenging our state. These are the things that make us, make us look weak, make the state look like it has lost its bite. Um, you know, uh, pe people who are contending with, uh, contending the monopoly of violence, which only the state should have, you know, committing all of these atrocities and removing the protection which the state should, or challenging the protection which the state ordinarily should provide its citizens. When this happens, what exactly is the plan of the state to say, look, we're still a state. We can still rise up to the challenge and protect our citizens. Yeah. I, I think that these are some of the key questions that we must continue to impress upon those who seek to uh, govern us in the 2023 elections. We really want to see the how. Uh, in, the, in the wake of uh, Mrs. Rahim's mother murder, uh, we've seen a number of presidential aspirants uh, reel out their condolence messages, etc., and they've talked about police reforms. What precisely do they intend to do about reforming the police to strengthen it to be able to solve these crimes on time? I know that in many crimes too, they still have unsolved murders. But the number of unsolved murders cannot be more than the ones that you actually solve. Uh, people cannot continue to commit crimes and get away with impunity. Uh, you mentioned political violence. It's good that the governor of Ebony State has put his foot down that the people, the political actors involved, be arrested. But beyond that, what more is going to be done? These are some of the questions uh, that I have on my lips, even as we continue to push forward, uh, that there must be answers provided to those questions. Buki and Coyote. Uh, truth is, Mark, where literally every Nigerian can add to that list, really, from maybe events in their communities, events in their states, or nationally as well. The list is almost endless. Truth. I mean, that's the truth. You can't take that away. But I, I wonder, really, if after all of these events we have seen over the course of the year, we sit back. And when I say we, I'm talking the security agencies, I'm talking government, even the people. But we know the security agencies and government have the primary responsibility of ensuring the security and welfare of Nigerians. I wonder if they sit down and say, okay, I mean, the example's given. So we had kidnapping. We've had lots of kidnapping in the country. What are the things we're doing differently or we need to do differently? Where are the places we drop the ball? Because clearly, uh, if you want to uh, nip security in the bud, as that expression goes, you need to be steps ahead of the criminals. We shouldn't play catch up. So it's important to sit back and say, okay, for kidnapping, how can we ensure that we are 10 steps ahead for political violence. How do we enter? We're in the political season, okay? It's just what, uh, a short of 60 days to the election. So, how are we ensuring that we do things better? I was shocked, maybe not too shocked, but I mean, it came to the fore again two weeks ago when a representative of the IGP at the National Assembly was talking about how they arrest people for political violence, and chief executives of states will come and say, oh, well, you need to release that guy. And I mean, their hands are tied. I remember hmm. that saying that, how would you, how would a policeman 
in the first place who earns how much? I'm not even sure, how, but paltry sum. How will that policeman challenge a chief executive, a state governor, or someone in high ranking? And I think we need to get to that point. That's one of the things we need to ensure, that the law is bigger than anybody. Once you're standing with the law, even if you're a corporal, you can challenge literally anyone because you have the backing of the law. I mean, the, the issues of, um, I mean, there were other instances given, but I think my point generally is, let's sit back, we're entering 2023, which will be more challenging than 2022. Believe me, it will be more challenging. It'll be the political year. There'll be lots of, well, is it bad blood? People will lose elections, literally. So yeah. it is going to be way more challenging than 2022. But I do hope that we have sat back to see the things we faced in 2022 such that we'll say these are the areas we think we dropped the ball and we need to stay steps ahead. If we don't do that, then we're ready for even a bigger shock. Nicola. Uh, indeed, Kayadi, it's really sad that you rightly noted that the list is endless. You know, why should the list be endless? You know, but what is more um, unsettling for me well, are two out of the myriad of issues that uh, we have highlighted this morning. First of all, Taraba State. You know, the three young men killed yesterday were brothers, children of the same father. Also, um, in Ebony State, the um, Ibubiago have been a target in recent times, particularly since the month of November. If you just read through, you know, the events in Ebony State, uh, you find that Ibu Beago, um, uh, sec the security network in that state, they've been killed, you know, more than once. So what exactly is the challenge there? In the most recent events in which uh, the state governor had to respond to, uh, the state commissioner of police said something about the event leading to the killing of three persons was a, as a result of um, you know, uh, uh, an uprising or something that had to do with um, Ibubeago. So uh, Ibubeago being used as uh, you know, political tools because we're in a political season, campaigns are at the peak in a matter of uh, months were going to go to the polls. So what exactly is happening? Um, the security, the, the police operatives in that state need to provide more explanations as to what is happening. And the uh, security outfit itself needs to come out and talk about why Ibubiago is a target in that state. In Taraba, for instance, the governor <clears throat> in the last year or two has been crying foul about how kidnappers, you know, and those who are holding the states to ransom have been sitting pretty. And, you know, we're, we're, we're always at that point when we come to that conversation where we talk about how governors are helpless because they're not in control of the security apparatus of the state. You know, so when we have a number a high number of unsolved murders as against, you know, those that we have solved. Malpe talked about how we should, um, you know, rise up and ensure that uh, we're still a state. If we're still a state, why do these killings, you know, why, why do they continue unchecked? It seems as if we're descending into a state of um, impunity. And where there's impunity, how far is it from a state of anarchy? Uh, there must be uh, decisive action taken by security operatives. And if the president has promised to leave the country safer than uh, when he found it, we're just a few months to the target date you know, for the handover. So uh, what legacy is the administration going to leave behind in terms of security? That's a very big question, you know, that um, all those charged with uh, ensuring that Nigeria is safe, that people can go to bed uh, and sleep with their two eyes. That's the question that they must answer this morning. Chamberlain. Oh, yes, indeed. So uh, we'll just go ahead and take you through some of the dailies and see what other issues they raise in just a moment. We'll start with Vanguard newspaper this morning. After years of neglect, primary healthcare centers collapse nationwide. And the writers here, the first of which says, most lack basic infrastructure, personnel, and drugs, only 6,000 functional in total. Declare emergency in primary healthcare, NMA says. Uncompleted primary healthcare is abandoned, after gulping 14 million naira in Ondo, FCT only 30 PHCs adequately equipped, and then 
60% of PHCs in Lagos defunct, ascribed to commissioner. We're talking about primary healthcare, the very basic, mm. let alone when you go further, where you require a lot more investment, you can then imagine what will, what, how those, how those will look like. This is us coming from a plan where the federal government was thinking of building one primary healthcare centre in every ward of the country. This is yeah. something that's supposed to be the core responsibility of local governments, mm -hmm. or even at best state governments. But this is what we have. And of, you know, <coughs> they've had several rolling plans, several health plans. They've modified it every five years, but we we'll still have this. And I don't think we're going to forget in a hurry how. Uh, after COVID, where the you know, Manda presidential team, mm -hmm. uh, led by the SGF, appeared before the House, and then the, uh, the night lawmakers saying they didn't know that our healthcare was that bad, and then you thought that okay, uh, you know, usually they tell you the very first steps to getting problems solved is acknowledging that there's a failure, or there's a challenge, or something is wrong. But in this uh, scenario here, it appears as though we defy a lot of these principles, as it were, because at, at the moment, this is what's been reported. It means what has then been done after that realization that we didn't know that our healthcare was this bad? So politicians have got to answer those questions. So, uh, I mean, yes, you could always support your candidates, but there shouldn't be blind support. There shouldn't be blind support, or else they will keep thinking they could get away with all sorts of things. Good murder. And look at what the, the, the picture you see there, it's just actually about landmines planted by suspected bandits injured too in Niger. So victims of landmines, that's the, the image you, which you see right there. So I know you keep wondering, how do landmines get past our security agencies and then they're planted? They take time to plant them, then they injure people. Then we just keep wondering what really is going on with And security. I think that even some types of mines or even mines in general have now been banned as a as an instrument of warfare because yeah, it's the, 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 the effects are, are felt way long after the war oh, has been over. Goodness. Um, you know, but somehow these things still find uh, their way into our crime and of course, you know, insurgents, bandits, all manner of people will will get their hands on them, and this is the havoc, the reek. Oh, sad though. That's Vanguard this morning. Looking at new Telegraph for you. Um, I'm the harbinger of good news <laughs> this morning. <laughs> <laughs> let's try and find something positive, and let's look at what's on the front page oh of New Telegraph this morning. It says New Year. Federal government raises hope of salary increase for workers. Okay. May invoke clause for removal of strike days from pensionable period. Okay, um, I don't know what that is about, but it's something about strikes and your pension. So you might want to take a look at that. Uh, but as I said, I'm the having of good news. I'm only going to look for good news on the front page, or at least neutral news. Maybe news that is neither good nor bad. It's just news, okay? Well, if they're going to apply that, uh, I think we should also find a way to ensure that whichever government agency or persons in positions of, of authority at that point, and it's found out that they didn't pay the salaries, they too, their, whatever entitlement is supposed to go to them, should be deducted as well. So it goes both ways. So not just punishing people because they're protesting for you not paying them. So if you didn't pay them, you too will be made to face some sort of stiff penalty as well. Is it about pay? I think it's about strikes. Yeah, he's saying that if you go on strike, mm -hmm. so they will vote the clause such that for the period that you're on strike, you won't get pensions for that period. Mm -hmm. So okay. That's what they're saying. So if that's the case, then if it's true, because would they just go on strike? Just like that. Uh -huh. So if they legitimately were not some... paid, yeah, well. who didn't pay them? It's Why didn't they pay? It's not just about being paid. I think it's about working. Um, the people who are supposed to pay, where are they working? Did they do their part? Have they satisfactorily done their own part by ensuring that whatever reasonable demands are being made, they try their best to meet them? No, should, should, oh. they, should we even come to that stage where they should even be talking about strike because of not being paid? It shouldn't even arise mm. in the first place. Well, it should not, not arise. Certainly not. Certainly not. I mean, or ne certainly never over your salary. If it's your yeah. your legitimate entitlement which has already been agreed, signed, sealed and delivered, by all means, certainly not. 
nobody should have to go on strike to get paid. That's in this economy of that's, ours. That's a sin. But this is what the federal government is saying. Raises hope. I hope this hopes are not dashed. But <laughs> <laughs> this is the oh, good news. I refuse to take <laughs> anything so too, away from it. <laughs> uh, out of it. Let, let, let's take a look at all the... Um, oh, see this one. Well, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. Make of it what you will. 2023, no end in sight to PDP crisis. Um, that's what he says. Maybe it's just what it is. It is what it is. Um, <laughs> you can interpret that as good or bad. Um, and then you also see in terms of politics and more politics here, Oshuntokun replaces Okupe as Labour Party campaign DG. Um... A boy in mayhem, police confirms three deaths. Omahi orders APC chair reps candidate arrest. Um, 5G, successful telcos to compete for 150 million internet subscribers. That is also there. And oil rises above $80 as China scraps COVID restrictions. So oil prices going up again, as I said. I only read good news this morning. <laughs> Let's see okay. only that which is good. Uh, no there, are other, there are other stories. Oh, look at this. Buhari to police. Justice must be done on Rahim's extrajudicial killing. So that directive also there from the police. If I did not read the news you're expecting me to read, please pick up the new telegraph by yourself. I read it. <laughs> but as I said, I'm only <laughs> reading good news this morning. Let's leave it there for new telegraph newspapers. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, I'm a harbinger of political news, if you could say it, really. So decide if that's good or bad. Take a look at Daily Trust newspaper uh, this morning. It's uh, on politics. So you see Tinubu, weakest camps meet to finalize deal on 2023. So decide which one that will be for you. Take a look at the writers. Parley holds this week in Europe. Our decision to be guided by a separate declaration reverse governor's ally. We will respect all agreements as she writes as associate. G5 Alliance won't affect Atiko's victory campaign council. So it looks like maybe, maybe, just maybe, we see where this is tilting towards, especially because he says it will reveal who will support and campaign for uh, in the coming days. That's come January. So that one, of course, uh, it's a build up. But under that, you see that story coming from a boy state. Race to Nasumai, two others in epic battle for a boy South senatorial seat. Uh, so yeah, we need to keep our eyes on that one as well, because with politics usually comes uh, the attendant security issues. Uh, this one is not so good news. Seven killed, 29 injured in Calabar carnival accident. So imagine what was meant to be celebratory turning sad with seven killed in Calabar. Really sad one. And uh, yeah, that story you talked about, FG to announce salary increase soon in Gigi. Uh, soon. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, I'll just leave it there for Daily Trust newspaper. <laughs> and from there, let's flip to the Nigerian News Direct this morning. Uh, I hope it has good news all through. But this one appears to, you know, give one cause to hope for a better future. Well, that's debatable. But this is how it's captioned. Harsh economy. FG to declare position on worker salary increment in 2023. So that defines soon, I guess. Yeah, that defines soon. Increase, under, increase rather, understandable in view of inflation, high cost of living, as ascribed to the Minister of Labour, Ingigi, expresses hope of increment by 2023. Says Presidential Committee on Salaries, NSIWC, working on salary review. And laments 2022 labour union actions of NMA, ASU and others. You find that. Uh, all of those details on page two of the Nigerian News Direct. I take a look at this one. I wonder what your experience was. Xmas holiday, long queues at ATM centers worsen. And the queues are still there, believe me. Uh, let's go above the nameplate now to find some more stories. Passengers lament high cost of transport as rail fails to operate. Uh, what exactly happened? During the Yuletide, it would have been, you know, good time to find the rail yeah, we need transporting to find out which Nigerians of the rails, seamlessly. Yeah, we need to know which of the rails didn't operate. Yeah. I know for the Lagos Sibana one, it was, what, what did my wife call it last time? Is it 29 sitting and what, 89 standing? Because, I mean, people stood and it, it was a sour point, really, for that. But I know that worked, but I don't know which 
uh, News Direct is referring to right now. Right. Well, we, you'll have to get a copy of a News Direct and you find um, the details on page 22. And uh, two more just before we exit. Fayemi Oyebanji, Canvas support for Tinubu APC candidates. That's ahead of the elections in 2023. And lastly, IMF warns Nigeria over dwindling oil revenue. Isn't that what we all know? Uh, Kayadi, the Nati report, you know, said Nigeria has lost 16.2 trillion, trillion, not billionaire, uh, to oil um, revenue in, in 12 years. Goodness. Goodness. What's the budget of the Benin Republic? <laughs> That came out of the blue so I need to say that well, Compared with six, I, 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 don't, I, I doubt that it's it's even you know up to the, the budget of Lagos State, mm. for instance. But to lose sixteen point two trillion naira, you know, to oil theft in twelve years, and in the loss in recent times, you know, have led nowhere. No yeah. prosecution, no names. Mm. We're just waiting. Let's leave it there for News Direct. Well, take a look at the Garden newspaper next. Hope deems. As 15.9 billion naira Nigeria Air lands in court, misses sixth takeoff, FG in desperate move to salvage, quote, unpopular venture, Boris 2015 pledge. Local airline operators, aviation unions divided on prospects. Analysts seek urgent review of model for sustainability. And then look at this. Ruto to sell loss-making Kenya Airways. So, while well, they're trying to sell theirs, we're trying to set up ours. So, um, different strokes for different folks, clearly. And so, um, yeah, and then you also get to see beneath the story, beneath the lead story here. Um, it will rise against Arthur Eze, others over opposition to Peter Obi. And speaking about all these rich men, I just saw one headline in in uh, Daily Trust, which says, I no longer enjoy life, hope to meet Allah in good faith, described to Dan Tata. So, uh, they all should know. Everybody will get the time to go to the great beyond. So what we do with it should be of essence, huge essence, I might add. And then, um, okay, well, look, there are several other stories, but I'll just leave it there with The Guardian today. Take a look at leadership for you this morning and uh, this delete story 2023 elections Atiku Obi Kwankwanso optimistic of victory on first ballot. Isn't that who they are? <laughs> Eternal optimists, Chamberlain calls them. <laughs> Politicians, always optimistic. Uh, candidate enjoys solidarity, support of majority of Nigerians. That's from the PDP. Labour Party insists projections show it's leading. Nigerians see Kwan Kwan So as only alternative. That's from the NMPP. We are making inroads. That's from the SDP. So if all of you are saying that there are only four major front runners, you might need to look again. Because you just heard the SDP. Yeah. We're making inroads. And as a matter of fact, they, yeah. they, unfortunately, some of their uh, offices were vandalized by thugs in rivers, which was reported today. So that's a concern that should be addressed as well. Indeed. So who's afraid of the SDP? Maybe they're really making inroads, as they say, and maybe that's why people are seeking to destroy their offices. After all, isn't the, the tree with plenty of fruits that gets the most, most stones? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I don't know. You might want to take a look at page four to get details on this optimism. Yeah. Uh, and look at this. It was a really tragic incident yesterday. Carnival Calabar. Oh. Many fear dead as car crashes into the crowd. Oh, yeah, about five people were killed in that incident and many more injured, uh, you know, seriously injured as a result of that particular incident. There was really a carnival that, you know, that miss, let's say carnival gone wrong. I mean, yeah. with the mishap that happened, but speaks to why we should also have medical personnel. I hope they had some stationed around that area. Uh, but page six is where you find details um, of that particular incident. Naira redesigned ATMs, still dispensing old notes 13 days after rollout. Wow. Well, yes, I can confirm that. That is very true. <laughs> going to the ATM, Why? No. thinking you get, oh, brand new notes. At least if you haven't gone to the bank, maybe 
you get to see the notes in your hand and lo and behold 500 naira old 500 naira notes you know roll out generously from the atm machine so for it to make it to the front pages you know that this is an issue if the atms aren't dispensing uh the new money yet where are people supposed to get it? especially in a place like the f-city mm -hmm. where are people supposed to get these new notes so big question um right there on page 25 16 abducted in fresh Kaduna attack. That is also there. Um, I'm not fretting over Gombe governorship race. That's from the governor of Gombe State, Inua. <laughs> I don't know any governor that is fretting. Or any. <laughs> I don't know which one. Oh uh, dear. Chamberlain, they always say these things. If you go <laughs> and check their BP, you'll know whether they are fretting or not. <laughs> Let's leave it there for leadership newspapers. But at the end of the day, they need to remember that there will be a winner and there will be losers. So the kind of messages you put out there is important. You let your supporters also know that. And I don't know about if the CBN is going to allow for some extension if 13 days after we don't have the new currencies with the ATMs. All right. Don't forget, you can also be a part of the conversation. Make your own comments. Send us a message, or tweets or emails. We will be glad to have them. We're back in just a moment here. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Sunrise Daily. Well, quite a number of issues on the burner here today. Uh, you've heard us talk about from security to economy to politics as well. well this morning, we've got uh, two gentlemen joining us uh, to shed light on some of the issues that we will be raising with them. Uh, Ambassador Jerry Ugoque is Deputy Director, APC Parliamentarians Directorate of the Presidential Campaign Council. He's also a former Permanent Representative of Nigeria to the United Nations. He joins us virtually from Ore. Good morning, Ambassador. Thank you for joining us on the program today. Good morning, and thank you so very much. And uh, compliments of the season. And I wish us all Nigerians uh, a, a much better uh, year to come in 2023. All right, thank you. We also do have Kola Ologbondiyan, who is a member of the PDP's Presidential Campaign Council. He's here with us in the studios. Good morning. Thank you good for morning, coming. Good morning, Champagne. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Nigerians. Compliments. Mm -hmm. Ambassador, let me start with you. Um, looking at this year and perhaps the preceding years of uh, the government of the APC, well, already we know challenges with the economy, with security, Almost uh, on a number of issues, many, just as you wished, will wish that it could have been a lot better than it is at the moment. But if we start from how things are currently playing themselves out, um, can you say you're near satisfied with the way your party has steered the ship of state so far? Well, let me start by... Um expressing my sincere condolences to the family of a uh, barrister. Bolanle, who was uh, killed a few days ago and the Aja Axis of, of Lagos, you know, by uh, a police officer. Uh, having said that, um, unless you're not uh, a human being, unless you're not a Nigerian, um, that you will not feel unhappy with the uh, security situation, uh, with people who had, you know, lost their lives uh, in the uh, past few years. One thing I want us to know is that no uh, leadership, unless it's not a leadership, you know, that is, uh, uh, you know, made up of human beings, would want uh, people to die, would want uh, terrorists, if you will, will want bandits uh, or whoever, you know, to kill uh, his people. So what the point I'm making is that, you know, my heart goes out to all who have lost their lives in terms of, uh, you know, the banditry and, and what have you. Um, you know, you know, and all of us know, there have been challenges, you know, um, in the past few years across you know, the, the, the across the world, if you will, across Africa. You know, a number of things that happened, migration and all kinds of things, invasion by, you know, all kinds of people, you know, trying to uh, get away and get into other places and, and, and do things that are, are, are not human. So we've had our own share of it. The point I want to make here is that the government did not go home to sleep. The government you know, once this started, you know, started putting a number of things in place. And if you will be honest with me, you will say that it has come down from what it used to be, you know, a, a couple of years ago. And that's what we look forward to. Well, Ambassador. You know, a situation where we can bring okay. it under control. That's, that's all we're, we're, you know, we're trying, you know, we're, we're praying to, to happen. But nobody would be happy that people are being killed. I am not. And I'm sure you're not. Well, so some of the uh, figures out here, if we could present them and see how honest those figures are. Uh, the Daily Report this morning that primary health care in the country has collapsed. And then we look at the unemployment rates. It's going south. Uh, the amount of Nigerians who are poor has increased. The latest being 133 million of them are poor. And several indices. And in an election year, naturally, Almost everyone who wants the seat, who wants to replace your party, say, look, those figures are a stark reality of what we're currently facing. And they don't think that after eight years that your party deserves another shot at the seat. I think, I think that would be a wrong way to analyze it. 
first of all, you 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 need to uh, put it in context. This is an administration that under which you had, you know, what you call a COVID pandemic, you know, which took the entire world, you know, by storm, which, you know, as well as you know, you know, for almost two years, we didn't go anywhere. We had to like stay indoors, you know. So it's not a normal eight years. It would be unfair for you to just say, oh, they didn't do well. However, that is why we are saying that this is a great opportunity to also, you know, give us, you know, an opportunity. Give Senator Ahmed Bolatinubu an opportunity. If there are, or rather, where, wherever there were things that were done wrong, for it to be correct, for, it, for them to be corrected. Now, um, I want to make a point here that... Um, Asiwaju Ame Bolatinubu is ready to turn this country around. If you talk about, you know, things that have gone wrong, you know, you, you better start, you know, you better think about uh, 16 years that uh, the other parties had ruled us. You know, you, it, it's, it's as good as you're saying, you know, uh, um, starting from, uh, 20, 2000, and, 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 and uh, I mean, the time, you know, the time we started, things were not the same. And like I said, we had issues. We had issues. We have very challenging issues. The oil prices went down to, you know, unthinkable uh, uh, prices, you know, which was not the same, you know, in the last administration. So, the point I'm making is that this is an opportunity for Nigerians to look at those who are contesting and say, look, we are saying that Asiwaju Ahmed Bolatinubu is one of, is, is the person who can turn this thing around. You know, this, it, like I said to people, if we look at what he did in Lagos and we give him an opportunity to do it in Nigeria, we can go home and sleep. I mean, this is obvious. You know, if you you, right. you you live in Lagos, and I'm sure you were in Lagos, you know, when Asiwaji was uh, was uh, was uh, the governor of Lagos. And what mm -hmm. we are saying is that he has the ability, you know, in terms of leadership, what you need is somebody who can identify talents, somebody who can identify people who can do the work and pull them together, and then you know, you know, All right, supervise them to do the great work. Thank you. Okay. Well, Mr. Lobo, the ambassador says that it will be a wrong way to analyze it if you don't factor in the COVID period within that eight years. So, what say you on that? Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chamberlain. Um, good morning, Ambassador. I expected you to be here with me. However, Chamberlain, we cannot sit down here and be discussing the COVID period. We have a tenure of eight years. That's my understanding. Then you are saying that six years, or let's say, let's even concede, five years of your administration doesn't matter. Your concentration is on the last two years. Where were we as a people? Where did the APC administration take us to in the first four years or first five years before COVID? What was the level of purchasing power? We had rising costs even as at that time. Because when I speak on issues like this, I want to address the feelings of the ordinary people out there. You just said that primary health care is in shambles. Where were we in that area? The honest truth, which APC has failed to agree or has failed to accept, is that they had no idea, they had no concept, they had no understanding about governance when they came into the administration. And as such, even as we speak today, what project have they conceived and brought into existence and completed? We have challenged them, and we are challenging them even on that. It's just, it just, it just, it just that this set of people who came together and formed a political party did not factor in the issue of governance. So they just it, wanted power. Is that that you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't factor in 
any of those infrastructural development that, for oh, instance, even, the Ministry of Works uh, even talking talk about. about infrastructural development, even if you ask them, they will tell you that they completed projects that were ongoing. Government is a continuum, isn't it? Wait now. Government is a continuum. But you must also have a legacy project that you can see that I, while I was in government, I did this. It's important. Is it about glorifying so themselves to bring not, it or not, making not, an impact? It has nothing lives. to do with glorification. It's got nothing to do with glorifying oneself. But it's about legacy. So if you come to government and you say that, oh, I didn't conceptualize anything. For instance, when they came in, they said they were going to sell off all the uh, aircraft in the presidential fleet. And, they will, and the president will only use one or two. And by so doing, they can start an airline that is wholly owned by Nigeria. Where is it? I don't see for me, and I believe largely for my party and our campaign. President Muhammadu Buhari is exiting. He has told Nigerians that he has done his best. Nigerians are saying that the best is not enough for us. However, how do we project into the future? Do we allow the same party who led us on a journey to nowhere and who has rubbished every fabric of our lives to continue by bringing the very person who claimed to have unilaterally to have singularly made Buhari president, and after making him president, propped him into failure in a manner, in a manner that he can now come back and say, oh, let me correct the ills committed by the person, the personality that I brought into government. I think that would be most unfair, even to Nigerians. Well, Ambassador, um, from, from the local thing to being, your candidate says that in mm -hmm. four years, four years, he intends to transform yes. the power sector and make and provide uninterrupted power supply. That's four years. So yes. uh, Mr. Lokbane mm -hmm. is alluding to the fact that you don't have to consider seven or seven years factoring in the other two years of COVID years. So he said four years should have been enough for you to make an impact. After all, that is what your candidate seems to be saying here. Well, let me uh, first of all correct what uh, Alagwende has said about um, uh, continuity. The, the, I think the, the, it is important to know that government is a continuum. It doesn't matter who, uh, what party that comes in. We are talking about Nigeria, my country and your country. So it doesn't matter that um, uh, PDP conceptualized something for over 16 years and never did it. In fact, you should congratulate you know, the, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for having the will. We conceptualized you know, for 16 years uh, the issue of train services in Nigeria. It never started. Only when somebody came and said, look, this must get started. You conceptualized the first, second Niger Bridge for 16 years and you never started it. And then you want to give you yourself credit for having, you know, a, a, a projects on the drawing board for 16 years. And then you want to discredit somebody who came and saw something on the drawing board that lasted for 16 years. And you say, hey, this must be done. This is for my country. This is for my people. That's what we're saying. Ambassador, it doesn't matter who if I may what. interrupt you. Yeah. Um, Ambassador, if I may interrupt you. Uh, I'm just yeah. reading... Uh, or a, a cursory look at uh, the, the message written by the Christmas mess of Christmas sermon written by Bishop Koka of Sokoto Diocese. Yes. I'm sure that you must have seen that particular mm -hmm. sermon by now. Uh, reading it, yes. you know, you, you, you get a sense that there are some things that this administration has done. I mean, he acknowledges the fact that there's been progress made in terms of infrastructure, even though Mr. Logbodino yes. says that, you know, there's none of them that you have conceptualized yourself, but at least they acknowledge that in terms of infrastructure, projects that were started have been completed. Um, but the most fundamental thing, you know, which the, the, the sermon seems to point at is the fact that some of the things that have been destroyed are intangible. Uh, Bishop Kuka speaks of a caste system. He says a caste system has emerged in our country. It has consolidated its hold and blunted the cutting edge of all institutions. 
A majority of its children are swimming against the tide for survival with no support, while the other cast smiles in the comfort of their jackets. Um, and he talks about how did this cast emerge in our country? Uh, we really need black Americans responded to caste by founding Black Lives Matter movement. We really need to rally together to destroy those who have institutionalized a caste system in our societies because every life matters. Uh, this particular, I mean, this particular statement, uh, he goes on to elaborate on it, talks, talk, talking about the reach against the poor, generational difference, um, etc. These are intangibles, but these are realities. Um, and he, it, it speaks to, I mean, it's at the bottom of leadership, which it would seem that your party has failed to provide in instances where it could have provided that leadership. I'll give you one instance. NSARS, the NSARS protest, which it would seem uh, was run mostly by young people, uh, was seen from a very different light by the president, uh, who thought that people, young people were trying to overthrow him, at least that they said that much. Um, how much leadership can you say that your administration or this administration has been able to provide when it comes to identifying some of these soft issues which join us together at the hip and, you know, and seem to be at risk of falling apart as we speak? I, I, I would want to honestly say that, uh, you know, uh, to some extent, the administration has done its best. Obviously, his best may not be good enough. And that is why Asiwaju Ahmed Bola Sinubu wants to come in and turn the situation around. I mean, like I said, you know, their best may not have been uh, 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 good enough. Right. I mean, it, it have, I mean, we are all doing our best. You know, our best may not be good enough, depending on who is assessing it. But the point I'm making is that this is a, a different situation. This is a situation where, where we're changing from one administration to another. It is not a point, it's not a time to be talking about yesterday. We are talking about today. We're talking about today and tomorrow. And today we are talking about you know, changing of leadership from uh, Muhammad Buhari to Senator Ahmed Bola Tinubu. You know, from there, you know, Nigeria will turn up. You in Lagos, you're happy that you can now do blue, uh, blue rail, you know, in Lagos. Can you imagine if we have how, all how over that anybody, in Nigeria? How can anyone trust your administration? And I think that's the biggest problem because th this was some of the ills that they identified in the PDP government in 2015. And decided I that look, we needed a change, which was what your administration you promised. Us. But eight years you down can. the line, we're looking at what is happening in the country, and people are saying, "How can we trust that the APC is not going to continue with just more of what we've seen in the last eight years?" It is not possible because Asiwazu Ahmed Bola Tinubu has shown in Lagos. You know, and even in Lake, the Lagos state government is showing today, you know, that APC can be trusted. The, the leadership of Asiwaju Ahmed Bola Tinubu, if you hand him over the mantle of Nigeria, that Nigeria is going to turn around. Yes, there were difficulties. Yes, there were issues, you know, orchestrated by uh, the price of oil. There was not enough money to do certain things when it was time to do it. Some of these things are time bound. Then, you know, the COVID and the rest of it. But we're saying that the, the, if, if you give Asiwaju Ahmed Bola Tinubu the opportunity to do what he did in Lagos, and he's ready to do it. Like I said, the, the, the key thing, you know, is like a coach. A coach is not the player himself, but a coach is the person who selects good players and put them on the field to be able to win a match. Asiwaju is a great coach who can select, like, you know, good minds, people who can change Nigeria, people who can turn Nigeria around and put them in the field. So, what I hear you say, Ambassador, that's what is we're that, talking about. Just a moment, Ambassador, and, if I may interrupt you. Yes. What I hear you say is that you acknowledge that indeed this caste system exists. Um, and that this is something no, no, that your no. party has, that been, I, has I been able to successful. That. No, that's what that I hear you mouth. say. I you're saying say that, that Ashiwaju will come and correct that. Is that what you're saying? I am saying that 
Nigeria is a work in progress. And when you have work in progress, you know, there may be some mistakes along the way. So the person who comes in will look, you know, uh, through the process and know if there are any mistakes, you correct it. And then you continue the good job that had already been uh, started. That's what we're talking about. And beyond that, you invent your own excellent uh, ideas, you know, to make things work. I'm saying, you know, that if Asiwa Zwamed Bola Tinibu comes, he knows the right people to pull together across the country, just like he did in Lagos. Brought Ibos, brought uh, uh, Northerners, brought all kinds of people to make Lagos work. That's all I'm asking. Give him an opportunity to bring, you know, people from across the country, no matter where they come from. That is what you're going to see in Asiwaju's uh, uh, administration. And what I'm talking Mr. about Mr. is I hate, I hate right. looking back. I want all to right, Ambassador, I, I, I have to take this now to Mr. Logbondio. Uh, if you look backwards, you have an accident. Did you hear me? If you keep looking backwards, you have an accident. But if you look forward, then you see a vehicle coming so that you know how to avoid it. You know, getting Asiwaju Ahmed Bola Tinubu to be the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is one I, I, best Ambassador, of uh, pardon me. I, I have to take the conversation right now to Mr. Logbodio. Well, you have heard his arguments there. I mean, he keeps saying that we, that, you know, that's the reason why, you know, the APC wants to try, he wants Nigerians to vote. Amashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. And I'm wondering, um, because even the candidate of your own party, who has been in the APC, who also, you know, sang the change song alongside Nigerians, and but now has gone back to the PDP and is now saying, look, we need to give this party another try. Can he really say that there is a major ideological shift or difference uh, between what the APC is selling. I mean, after all of these people came together to install the president, or should I say to make him president in 2015. Can he say that there's really anything fundamentally different from what the APC is selling Nigerians now and what your party, the PDP, is asking Nigerians to vote it for? Thank you very much, Mark. Before we go into that, let me quickly correct some, some of the assertions raised by uh, uh, Ambassador Jerry Bukwe. One, he said that the Niger Bridge was at the, uh, at the preparatory area that was just at, at the conceptualization level and that they came and built it. That's not correct. That's a lie. The federal government share, as at, as at the time Jonathan left office, was 30 billion. You know, it's a PPP project. And before Jonathan left office, about 21.2 billion of that federal government part had been paid. And I can clearly say from the, from the reports as of 2015 that 38% of the job was ongoing, which was abandoned when they came into office. Having established that, I just want to say that because Jerry Gokwe is from Anambra State. The bridge in question is, in, is around Anambra State. And I expected him to come into the public arena and speak to the truth. The biggest problem, one of the biggest problems of the APC administration is that they don't give credit. They will never say that, oh, PDP did this, but we completed it. That's wrong. Then they went ahead and spoke about the theory of, uh, of, of, of coach selecting uh, uh, players. And that because uh, as far as you selected players or those in government in Lagos, they should give him to Nigeria. They should give him Nigeria to handle. That's very fallacious. As you has claimed responsibility unilaterally of bringing Baba President Muhammadu Buhari into office. And Nigerians generally have said the man has performed below expectations. Okay, well, let's that, just speak that, to that, the that, other that, issues. That, yeah, I'll, I'll go to those yeah, issues. We'll return that, in just that, a moment. We need to go to break. So, my apologies, but we'll come back and let you continue when we return. Just stay with us. Welcome back to Sunrise, Eddie. Mr. Lebono, you are making some. Yes, I was, say, I was saying that he came up with the theory of the of the coach that oh, as you can selected them, selected the good players in Lagos State. 
And so he should be allowed to come to national again and select another player or become the player himself. The last player he selected for Nigerians. Nigerian said he could not score a goal, but he performed below expectations. Is that a fair assessment? So, Mr. So, Lo so, Mr. Logbun, in just a moment, that, 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 some people will say that uh, he did not select um, you know, um, the, the president. He didn't. There was a primary in 2015. There was a primary in which the current uh, flag bearer of your party contested in and lost. It, it, it was there for everybody to see. So can you really say that um, Ashwaju selected or, you know, picked him as a player, you know, and, 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 and you know, gave him to Nigerians? Ma, ma, is, is that ma, the same assessment? Ma, okay, ma, okay, I'm very happy with the analogy that you have brought. So let's discuss it now. I see what you call a met, you know. I didn't bring the analogy. I'm just oh, saying oh, oh, that this okay, is the fine. situation. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm building on your own oh, analogy. Oh, my own analogy. Good. I see what you call a met, you know. Went to Ogun State and declared, recorded before Nigerians, that President Muhammad Buhari had lost elections three times and that he was crowned, crying, that he, he became a tank crier until he, I see what you call a met, you know, went to him and said, stop crying. You will be president. And that he made him president. Have you forgotten that? And thereafter, he said after him, Emilokon, are you not aware? So, so if he selected a player according to him, not according to anybody, I'm not raising a fresh issue. I'm telling you what I'm, I'm reporting back. Are you what saying witness. that I'm, I'm, and just, I'm sure And I'm sure you are also can, aware can of Can I that. ask you then, are you yes. saying that we should discard the primaries that happened in Lagos? No, you are not. We are not it's not about, it's, it's, it's your choice whether you want to discard the no, primaries. No, no, I'm asking or, you. you know it's, it's a I'm question. Afraid, afraid, you know why I say it's a choice? As much as I met to the come to the public arena, to declare that he made Buhari president. So what you choose to believe will be relative. Do you understand? Because he has come out to say it. He has come out to own it. However, let's leave that. You ask a question. The, yes, the you also question ask I a asked question. You. you also yes. ask a question about what my candidate will do this time. Because it was in APC. I think Abaka had never denied that he was in APC. He has never denied that. But at the point when he discovered that the purpose of governance for which they went into APC for would be unachievable, he left. He did not only leave at every point in time in our national life. Atiko Abaka will come out and say, this is what government is doing, or this is the alternative. Way. Why don't you go about it this way? He left after he lost the primaries. Look, it is, it is, it is the material at the point in which he left. But having said that... Because you made it some material, so no, that's no, why we had no, to bring no, that. At the, point which right. left, at the point in which he left, it is the material. But he left, and when he came out of that uh, uh, contraption, he began to provide alternative. Right. He began let's, to assure Nigerians that we can get it better. Let's bring in our colleagues to have more questions for both of you. Go ahead, guys. Well, thank you, Chamberlain. Uh, I, I know this is, is going on, really, and, and those issues are very important. But some of the points maybe that Nigerians will also want to hear about, uh, I'll, I'll take us back to there because we started off from that point, And I'll go back to Ambassador. Uh, you said that you really are a person of today and tomorrow, that you don't like looking backwards but a lot of nigerians would say well we got here as a function of what we experienced in the past what few years so it's important to still speak to that so it won't seem like you're glossing over it such that you know what you, you you're not minding the feelings or the emotions or the situation that nigerians are in right now and just some of the figures that chamberlain was talking about earlier i'd like to extend them so inflation currently 21 percent it was less than 10% before your party came into power. Even before COVID, it had gone above that 10% which your party met at uh, petrol price. I mean, some don't even have access to petrol right now, but for some who have access to it, they buy it for upwards of 200, 300 naira. It was less than 100 naira before your party came into power. Unemployment is at 33% now. It was less than 10% when your party came into power. Poverty, 133 million Nigerians. It was way less before your party came into power. I mean, the value of Naira to a dollar, it is what, almost nearing a thousand Naira now. We know what it was before your party came into power, less than 200. The crude production, it was 1.8 million barrels per day, even sometimes more than that before your party came into power. At some point, we had less than 1 million just a few months back. We're climbing upwards just of 1 million Naira now in your party's context. So 
if you say you're a man of today and tomorrow, uh, no. would you discountenance the yesterday of Nigerians, which has brought them to where they are right now? Just to be clear on that point you were making, are you saying that you really do not care about what Nigerians have gone through and your own uh, focus now is on tomorrow? Just get your party in power. Yes, be, uh, before I, I, I speak to that question, let me speak to my very good friend, um, uh, Kola. You know, Kola had been uh, publicity secretary of uh, the PDP for a long time, and uh, he's a good guy. The point I, I want to uh, uh, bring out is that this is the same presidential candidate of his who left the party, you know, and went to help in forming the APC of today, contested primaries for presidential candidate and lost. And because he lost, he took a walk and went back, you know, I, I'm sure if there was any other place to, any other strong party to, to have won the uh, presidency and then be very uh, um, competitive, he would have gone there. And then he came back and I know the kind of feeling that uh, my friend Paula had when he joined hands to form the APC. And today, he's the best guy to turn Nigeria around because he has come back to his party. Be that as it may, let me uh, talk, speak to uh, the question that you asked. Uh, to start with, I said clearly, um, you do not have to continue to look back when you are moving forward. It is important that you look at your rear mirror and see what is happening there. But when you're driving forward, you don't turn yourself backwards and keep constantly looking backward. That's the analogy that I am giving. Yes, some certain things you know, have happened, and we, we have taken note of that. We know things have not gone as well as you know, some of us may expect it to have been. Yes, we are mindful of that. But we are talking about today and tomorrow. Yes, we are aware of what happened yesterday. And that is why we want the best man to be in the system. To tell me, you know, that because Asiwa Juame Bola Tinibu, like my friend Paula said, was one of those who brought in Buhari, that he selected Buhari. That is wrong. The primary selected Buhari. And that is also the same primaries that is that has selected, you know, uh, his presidential candidate. So that is not assembling made. a team. Uh, on that I mean point, you made team, ambassador. The team that I'm talking about is the cabinet of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. All right, uh, ambassador, and just quickly on that point. To question, uh, answer me. to your question. Yes, we know the things that have gone bad. And we are prepared to change it. And that well, is you why. You said that, um, I mean, it's, you don't want to look back while you're moving forward, but it was convenient for you to look back and no, say no, that no, your no, candidate no, no. Uh, no, no. really literally brought Lagos to, face, to where it is you don't today. Want to face so that's you actually you looking back and forward. using what happened yesterday uh, to sort of yes. you know, convince Nigerians to vote for a party. So when it's convenient, you look back and say your candidate at least no, did no, some no, work no, no. in Lagos. But when it's not, no, you say, well, no. don't let's look back at what happened in the past seven, eight years of your party in power. Why is it that convenient? No, what I'm saying, you probably didn't understand me. What I said is that you do not have to, you know, turn yourself back when you are driving forward. You look at your rear view mirror once in a while, you know, otherwise, you know, but if you turn backwards and you're driving forward, you definitely have an accident. That's what I'm saying. So we're, you know, we, we are mindful of what, what has happened. We're mindful of what you're talking about, the statistics that you're really now. We are mindful of it. And that is why we want to bring the best man on the job, to be able to turn those things around. That's what we are talking about, you know. Again, well, well Ambassador. Just, you know, just, just before you brought me in, well, ambassador. I, I saw those commercials. Can you hear me? I hope, just before you brought me in, I hope you saw those commercials about Lagos State which just aired on your television, you know, about what Asiwajibola Ahmed Tinubu did in Lagos. Believe you me, with people like us around, we're going to even do better. That's what we're talking about.
Well, Ambassador, it's impossible sometimes to, or it's important sometimes to look back, you know, even as you try to go forward. So you reflect on the mistakes of the past. Uh, the important thing is the the, the All Progressives Congress came to power on a tripod of promises that security, anti-corruption and the economy. Uh, and the question at this point is, has the party delivered on these three promises? Uh, from the statistics that uh, my colleague Kadi reeled out, uh, I, I, I believe the answer is a very big no. And your candidate, whom you are selling now, uh, sold President Buhari to Nigerians. So the question is, why should uh, Nigerians now entrust the mandate to someone who uh, sold an administration that has failed to deliver on its promises to Nigerians? Well, I, I think it's important to note this. When it is important, when it is convenient for you, you talk about administrations. When it is important to others, they talk about individuals. You see, like I said, it is important to know who is going to be at the helm of affairs. It is very critical to know who is going to be the head coach. And the head coach who is coming in now is Senator Ahmed Bola Tinubu. Just be honest with yourself. Well, um, uh, Ambassador... Look at what, compare him, and then let us see if any of them comes anywhere close him and we are saying yes you know just like you're, you're talking about now it was convenient for uh, the candidate of the pdp to come in there help and form apc was not able to win uh, the the the, um, the, 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 the the presidential uh, ticket then moves back to uh, uh, pdp then it's convenient for his vice presidential candidate at that time you know, uh, to not win presidential candidate if, you know, when he wanted to move to another party. Uh, well, Ambassador, we Ambassador, about. it's just as, it is it's not just convenient to look at uh, the administration right now. It's important uh, so that Nigerians can make informed decisions. And speaking of informed decisions, I, I wonder if you are zealous uh, in your defense of your candidate as you are in looking, taking a critical look at uh, the uh, party's manifesto, your presidential candidate's manifesto. Uh, speaking of which, he's promising uh, to stop fuel subsidies from his manifesto, increase crude oil production to 2.6 million barrels per day by 2027, yes. and 4 million mm -hmm. barrels per day by 2030. The question is, how yes. will this be achieved in the light of the current circumstances that we find ourselves in? Uh, there's crude oil theft, which is, uh, you know, has not been covered uh, uh, in this document about how that will be tackled. Thank you so very much. You will be, uh, I am happy for this question you asked. The reason is that, you know, this or the, what he has Felt out in that, and it is um, first of all, you. It is not possible for you to begin to publish on the uh, in a public uh, uh, document how you are going to uh, catch people who are stealing our oil and all that. The important thing is that you have said you will do it. You know the details that you have. You are going to be able to do it. You can imagine this oil theft has been going on for as long as you know, uh, over 20, 30 years in this country. And this administration was able to uh, discover it. You can imagine what will happen if you give Asiwaju the opportunity to be president of Nigeria for the next four plus years. The issue of oil tap, you know, has bedeviled Nigeria over many years. I served Nigeria as uh, the permanent resident representative to OPEC in Vienna. And I know what these issues are, you know, and I know that with uh, the, the kinds of people that Asiwaji is going to bring together, it is, I mean, it's, it's going to be a thing of the past. That I can sit here and All tell right, you for free that that we, is what is to, going to happen. All right, we need to wind down now. So, Mr. Logbani, your, your candidate also spoke about some 10,000 megawatts of electricity uh, in four years, and then ensuring that we also have stable power supply moving forward. 
How is that going to happen? Thank you very much. But before I go into that, let me quickly respond to uh, Ambassador Ogokwe. He used the analogy of a traveler who is driving. And he's saying that, oh, you should, you should not look back. You should be forward looking. You can look at your review, review you mirror can, once in a while. Can, you can only be forward looking when you are making progress. In a situation where the APC has taken our nation on a journey to nowhere and carry us go where we don't know, you cannot entrust our future into their hands. And Chamberlain, Jerry Gokwe needs to know that no matter how far a man travels in the wrong direction, the day he discovers, or the moment he discovers that he's on the wrong path, he must make a U-turn. Nigerians have discovered that for the past almost eight years, APC has been carrying them on a journey where they don't know where they go. So how will you continue to follow them? It's power not possible. Sector. We need to now, going to the power sector, yeah. our, my candidate and the candidate of Nigerians, Atiku Abubakar, has said that we need to move the power sector from the exclusive list to concurrent. And I believe that we can generate... Hasn't that been done already? I, I, no, it's, it's, the law is in the process. It has not been achieved. And as you know, under this, under this administration, President Mohamed Dubai, even the restructuring that, that, uh, that uh, uh, Asiwaju sang from the beginning of his political career to the time he was able to, be, to, to install the president according right. to him, he hasn't been able to achieve it. But having said that, for instance, Akwai Bomb State is generating power. But you need, you, know, you need to come and take permission from the federal government, Minister of Power, before... But you said the law is in process. So, 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 so soon that will be so, history. So, which history? Under, in less than five months. Yeah, under this National Assembly. Under this National Assembly. The Assembly hasn't wound down, have they? Uh, They're still in session. Chamberlain, I say restructuring. That was the sing song of Asua Jibola Ahmed Tinubu. All right. Since he began his political career in, 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 this, in, this, in this administration, since, 1990, since 1999, in this republic, since 1999, he has not been able to achieve it. They set up committee. They came to the National Assembly. What has come out of it is only our candidate, Atiku Abaka, who is speaking to it. Right. And on that we, power sector, I'm, I'm, I'm assuring you yeah. that 10,000 megawatts, as promised by Atiku Abaka, can be generated. And... <laughs> We will talk about. Has no space again. We'll talk this, about. This position. We'll talk about that. Uh, the power sector for all of these political parties moving forward. The how bit of their promises when we come back for the next segment. But now we have to thank both of you for coming on, Ambassador Jerry Ugoque, Deputy Director, APC Parliamentarian Directorate of the Presidential Campaign Council. He's also former Permanent Representative of Nigeria to the UN. We also had Kola Ologbondi, a member of the PDP's Presidential so Campaign Council. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us today on the program. Thank you very much, Chamberlain. Malpe, thank you. Thank you, Chamberlain. I'm happy new. All right. We're back. Thank you. We're back in just a moment, everyone. Stay with us. is one of the six projects under the Abuja Ring Project, executed by the Transmission Company of Nigeria. The project is funded with a loan of $170 million from the French Development Agency. The Minister of Power, Mr. Abubakar Aliyu, is inspecting the project as the government hopes to commission them before the end of the year. The government of President Muhammadu Buhari in his quest to raise the operational capacity of the NESI, the Nigerian Electricity Supply Industry. Uh, this is one of the projects that is being done in order to achieve that. So uh, it's called Ring Project, Abuja Ring Project. Uh, the Dawaki on the Guarim Power on is uh, over 90% completion. And so are others. As you can see here, uh, what is the percentage completion of this place? This one is 96%. The projects are located in Dawaki, in Buari Area Council, Guarimpa, Apo, Lugbe, and Wumba, in Abuja Metropolitan Area Council, and Kujetown, in Kujie Area Council. 
Another source of concern is the disruption of the 700 megawatts Sungeru power generation project by bandits. However, the minister has some good news. Zungero will have completed Zungero since uh, January, and then January. But you know what happened in Zungero, where uh, uh, insecurity there stalled the, the, the progress of the project. But now uh, everything of the military and the uh, other uh, security agencies have brought in uh, men uh, and assist in securing that area. President Mohamed Dubari had pledged to increase the capacity of the Nigerian electricity supply industry. And the minister is appealing to Nigerians to be patient with the government as they work to actualize this quest. So to speak to that and some other issues in the power sector and whether or not the politicians in their manifestos concerning what they promise can do any better. We've got, as you've seen there, Usman Mohammed, who is the former managing director, actually, of Transmission Company of Nigeria. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning, uh, Chamberlain. Well, Good morning, okay. we know that there's been, there's always a huge question mark about transmission in this country. Whenever... There's an issue. There's always trans transmission always comes into the mix, one way or the other. You've seen that report, and you've been there. So, first, could you start with giving us your impression of where our power sector is at the moment? Thank you very much, uh, Chamberlain. Um, if you look at uh, the power sector as of today, I think uh, things are worse than when I was removed uh, in May 2020. Um, we have, uh, at that time, the main problem that we are facing are transmission and distribution. Uh, generation, uh, we had enough generation at that time. Uh, the only problem we have is that there are certain areas that we need to have generation for, for balancing the grid, for, 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 for voltage support. Um, you know, if a, if a place is located far away from a generation station, you have a voltage problem. So places like Meduguri, places like Kano, we have voltage problem. But at that time, we don't have problem of generation inadequacy. But unfortunately, as of today, we also have problem of generation inadequacy. If you look at a station like Egbin, which is the largest uh, generation plant in Nigeria, um, that has a capacity of over 1,300, they, they can't generate more than 500 megawatt as of today. Uh, some of the power Sorry, plants... generation plants, is that? Egbin, 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 Lagos. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, the, some of those power plants that are around um, uh, Afam and Alauji, some of them are significantly having gas constraint. Um, I think some of the IOCs moved out, and I think we are not able to manage them very well. So we have significant gas supply problem. What about the dams? Yes, the dams. Uh, there we have uh, Kaenji and Shiroro. I think the... They are awarded contracts to recover certain gas top, I mean, uh, hydro turbines. I think they have made some progress. Maybe they have recovered one or two, but that cannot fill the gap of this shortage of, uh, uh, of gas, gas supply. So we are now, sometimes we don't generate even up to 3,000 megawatt. That is true. I know that, uh, in fact, before we go to some of what the politicians say they want to do, there's this PPI, Presidential Power Initiative, which used to be, uh, Nigeria Electricity Roadmap. Now, the government says they had that project. It was in, supposed to be in three phases. And ultimately, it was meant to give us some 25,000 megawatts. The first phase was supposed to be 7,000, 11,000, then 25. They've taken delivery of some items. And so the president is really optimistic about that project getting us far ahead. How do you see that? Play? Thank you very much. Um, you know, I came from African Development Bank. I actually came because Manitoba Hydro, that was managing TCN, um, did not manage the company very well, and it became very problematic. Some of the problem that was created by Manitoba Hydro include the fact that uh, for four years that they managed TCN, there was no single audit of the organization. And they expand the managerial cadre of TCN from 10 general, manager, um, 10 general managers to 46 general managers. 
and then from other uh, uh, 11 assistant general managers to 134, which is like anarchy. You are like you managing a company with 46 directors. How do you explain <laughs> that kind of uh, uh, issue? So this is one of them. And then they have not been able to raise a single investment for all the four years that they are. They are. Of course, some of the fault are not theirs. We have also a problem uh, as, a, as a country. But we paid officially $32 million for Manitoba in managing TCN. So when their time ended, um, the government is wisdom uh, invited me. Um, Chambarin, you know, the government approved my appointment actually on the, on the 19th of August 2016. But I didn't come till December because of the problems associated with our country. I actually didn't want to come. But when we came, we, we came after we discussed and agreed the guideline and how we are going to work with the government, that is the then Minister of Power. Um, we started with a program because I worked in the sector, I know all the problems. So I came with a plan actually. Uh, within this short time that we, we came, we were able to do the 20 year least cost transmission expansion plan that looked out our expansion and excluded the need for us to go for this, what they call uh, 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 super grid, but states stated in that report that we should restrict ourselves to the expansion at 330 at this level. But we can explore the other options of 330. That was how we come up with the court, court line. It's the first time that we have court line in Nigeria. And then after we conducted the study and we came up with the 20 year least cost transmission sanction plan, we now came up with the uh, 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 transmission rehabilitation expansion program. Under that program, that is how we go, that's Abuja, ring, ring uh, this in the heart of the land that will come from Lafayette to Abuja, which will give Abuja three sources of 330 to Abuja, which means that if two lines goes out, the one from Ajakuta to Abuja and the one from, Kebi, uh, from uh, Shiroru to Abuja, they goes out, Abuja will still have supply. Why? Because we'll have 330 that is coming from, from Lafayette. But let me tell you what happened. Um, I think so that we don't waste too much time on talking on the history, but this issue of uh, presidential power initiative, actually, it came in the same way the NIPP happened. NIPP happened. And uh, if you look at all the, the picture that is painted, and if you look at the uh, uh, video of how they will electrify Nigeria, you think that this is, a, a, is, a, is, a, is something that is going to talk uh, this but I want to ask you, has anybody ever told you the scope of this presidential power initiative, especially for transmission? What do you mean the scope? Because scope, the, the, what are the content? What are the content of the project? How many substations are they going to build? How many lines are they going to build? As of today, the content of that presidential power initiative is intervention in upgrading in seven substations. That is the one that is currently going on. Then they are supplying some... Uh, mobile transformers and uh, spear transformers. Yeah, that well, is what that is what, what 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 it is. Yeah, because the president now says, I want to tell you something. Let me just add this to it. He says that ten power transformers, ten mobile substations would have been delivered yes. and installed by May 2023. So what I want to tell you is that what is ten mobile transformer and ten uh, uh, power uh, power uh, spear power spear transformer? What is it? What we are talking about is that all this that they are talking about is not up to 2% of what we are doing under the Transmission Rehabilitation Expansion Program. And yet, the moment the government put this issue of doing the Presidential Power Initiative, they, they distracted uh, TCN from focusing on what they are supposed to do. So, Dr. Mohamed, wait, are you saying that this PPI hmm. cannot achieve the first phase of 7,000 megawatts, let you how? To how will how megawatts. will seven upgrading in Apple upgrading in uh, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, what do you call it in uh, Talata Mafara upgrading in uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, in, uh, in Katampe uh, and uh, four other substations take you to 7,000 megawatts? It's not possible. So instead of us to focus on the real pro the one that we have worked on, first of all we have carried out all the studies. Let me give you an example. We embarked on a project in Lagos. Mm -hmm. We are putting four 330 KB substations between Ogun and Lagos. One in uh, at Adibajo, one in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, New Abara, one in, uh, uh, in uh, Mantu on Fire, and then one in um, uh, this one other place. Then 132 in, um, 
in uh, uh, life uh, the redeem, and then another one in uh, in uh, Badagri. This this project include lines 330 and 132. All the studies have been concluded when I was in MD. Uh -huh. We have concluded this study, and this project is putting power at the industrial base of Nigeria between Lagos and Ogun. How much? When power? I was MD, when I was MD, how much power is it putting? It's putting. Four 330 KV substations and two 132 KV substations, mm -hmm. brand new. A total of how many megawatts? So many megawatts. I can't calculate here and, and give you, but so many megawatts and with lines. And it's attacking the industrial base of Nigeria. We've completed the study. We included the counterpart funding, which is the only thing that is needed to pay the compensation for the right of way, which is about $3 billion in the, in, the, in, the, in the Ministry of Power's budget. As at the time when I was MD, before I was sacked. But do you guess what? Up to now, the compensation for right of way was not paid. The design has been completed. Everything is completed. Now we are focusing on presidential power initiative that even the studies were not concluded. Which one of the, the, the one that upgrading or existing of station does not require study. But now you say you want to close the loop in Lagos between uh, Akamba and uh, Alagbon. Only the scoping study that I did when I was MD, which is getting to three years now. Up to now, we are at that level. And you want to build 330 multi circuit tower, which will carry 330 and 132, and you have not done the but study. Yeah. This project started in 2021, this PPI, and it must have been conceived in 20, before that time while you were still you, in office. You, Did you raise any of these objections? Of course. If you read, uh, I mean, I was invited to come from African Development. I told you there are two letters that were written by the government of Nigeria. But when I was sacked, there was no query, there was nothing. Um, there was a paper that carried out study to find out what happened. I think it was Delhi Trust. And what they stated was that the reason why I was sacked is because I didn't align TCM program with that of uh, Siemens. But that's not uh, that uh, project. I thought they said it was also related to a union matter. No, no, no. The president like general of the union. No, no, no. no. You see, if you look at the union of TCM, um, the union comprises of two. You have senior staff association and you have, uh, you have uh, Niwi. Nui. Of course, when I was coming, it was Nui that objected to my coming. Their thinking was that, um, uh, I mean, there was a publication that uh, I have come from African Development Bank to sack staff. So on the basis of that, they objected to me. As at the time they were objecting to me, they didn't know who I was. Because I've worked with them, they know my character. So because my name was pronounced as Usman Guru Mohammed, my full name, so they didn't know it was me. But when I was in Nepal, my name is Yuji Mohammed. So eventually, when I show my face and so, the issue died down. At the end of the day, the staff union and us, we are in the same page. How? Because we did staff welfare that has never been done in the history of the uh, power sector. We mobilized staff and we, inst uh, we inst intensified them. And staff installed 75 power transformers across the country, including more than 10 mobile substations that they are talking about. You sure. understand? So the only disagreement that happened was that there was a time, you know, the, my first appointment was for one year. Because I was the one who insisted I, I don't want to stay longer because I don't even know whether I can be able to solve the problem. Well, now, but, but, the, but the, the president of uh, Senior Staff Association was one who was, uh, for the whole country, was one who wanted to use his office to become the general manager of Lagos. Okay. But we but, didn't agree at that time. That was the that he was making noise. But why, if you no could just break it down and as, as, as short as possible, if you can, yeah. why is it that till today we still have issues with transmission? Because whenever we hear generation, they'll tell us, look, we have a huge install capacity. And then distribution will tell you, well, we also have capacity to distribute to way much more than we're given. But they always say, a problem in the country has always been transmission. Why of has course, that always uh, been a challenge? Of course, transmission can always be a problem. And it's not only in Nigeria, anywhere. But you have to focus and then come with strategy on how you move. Um, I want to tell you that um, uh, um, uh, we took a decision to fix transmission. When I was MD of TCN, I don't think any disco has a problem of uh, transmission and we are not able to fix it. That does not mean that we have solved all the problems of TCN. Yeah, because whenever TCN the more than, than 4,500 megawatts. I promise, I promise. TCN is supposed to run on the capacity of redundancy. And the electricity actually is supposed to be run on the capacity of redundancy. That was how you are able to have stable power supply. Meaning, um, if the generation capacity is 10,000 megawatts, transmission capacity is supposed to be 20,000. 
And distribution is supposed to double of that transmission. That's how you can have a reliable power supply. But I want to tell you that I don't believe, even as of today, transmission is the main problem. No, the main biggest problem is actually distribution. Because no investment came to distribution since the privatization took place. And most of the expansion and distribution were done at 33 kV. So what is our transmission capacity today? When I, le when I left, our transmission capacity was simulated to be 8,000 megawatt. Um, 8,000 megawatts? Yes, yes. And as of today, I know the capacity will be around 10,000 megawatt. And I believe that there are several work that I've done after I left. Of course, they were distracted. If they have concentrated on transmission rehabilitation and expansion program, of course, any intervention, including the Siemens, is useful. But to say that it is the Siemens that will take us to this megawatt uh, is a mirage. I don't think uh, if, the, if, if anybody is challenging, let them come up with the scope. And uh, let's put engineers to analyze and come up with what, how much would, what, what they are doing going to come up. So, uh, my brother, part of our biggest problem is that we don't have sense of history. We forget things easily and we change from one point to another without reflecting of where we made mistakes. And we are not focusing on fixing the mistake that we made. How did we create a problem for the power sector? We create a problem for the power sector by creating industry that cannot attract investment. Which now, industry is that? That's the power industry. If you look at, uh, apart from the intervention that has been done by government since the privatization, and few interventions that took place in generation, where is the intervention uh, uh, that, that comes in? Okay, we'll talk about that because I think the Senate say they've addressed that matter, but we'll raise it. But at the moment, uh, my colleagues would like to have some questions for you as well. Go ahead, guys. So, Dr. Mohammed, I'm concerned about, you know, the approaches the political parties are proposing to tackle the power problem. For instance, you read some manifestos. Uh, they are talking about um, building new infrastructure. Some are talking about using the Egypt model to address Nigeria's power sector. But I wonder if that's the real problem. You say the real problem lies with distribution, which brings in the problem of funding. Uh, some of the discos are being owed to the tune of 93 billion naira uh, by agencies. And they in turn say that they are owing, uh, um, you know, the GENCOs. So these party manifestos, in your own view, will they address holistically the problem of power supply if any of them is implemented? Thank you very much. I think there was a program that took place in Lagos where I was one of the key panelists, where uh, it was organized by PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, PwC. And we analyzed the, 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 the manifestos of the political parties. And the conclusion is that... Uh, uh, most of them didn't do any deep down analysis of why we are staying at 4,000 megawatt for years. No, no, they didn't do it. And then they come up with what you call a declaration that, okay, 20, we are going to move to 20,000 megawatt, we are 25,000 megawatt. But there was no analysis to show how this will arrive, be arrived at. So the conclusion is that uh, we believe that uh, most of the major parties don't even understand the power sector. And the fear is that, uh, like uh, previous uh, uh, interventions, uh, it's likely because the power sector has also a significant number of vested interests that will not even allow you to think properly if you, are, if you don't understand it very well. So there's the belief that if they enter government like that, vested interests will cover them and at the end of the day, they are not likely going to move forward. But if you talk about this declaration of uh, moving from 4,000 megawatt to 25,000 megawatt, um, where did we have reference? In history, where did you see a country move from 4,000 megawatt to uh, 20, 000, uh, 25,000 megawatt in four years. I can't, re I can't refer any country that has been able to move like that. So we have to understand that the power industry is a slow industry. It takes time for, it to, 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 for investment in the power sector to, 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 to manifest. So um, if you look at clearly what they are stating, it's very difficult to, to think that they'll be able to, 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 to move forward. So our thinking is that I think there's good, there's need for us to do better engagement with the political parties for, that, for them to have a clear understanding of the power sector. And there's also a need for Nigerians to have a consensus, what we, what we can call uh, non-partisan consensus on the power sector, so that we, we know that any party that comes, this is where we are moving, because one political party cannot solve the problem of, uh, of uh, TCN. And uh, I mean, of uh, power sector. What I mean is that in four years, you are not going to solve the problem of power sector. So it means that we have to have non 
partisan political, I mean, non-partisan consensus on how we want to move forward. Um, on the issue that you are talking about um, uh, uh, distribution, you know, the mistake we made was that um, we privatize all the distribution network at the same time. We are supposed to have done it in phases so that we learn experience and then we, we move forward. That is one mistake. The second mistake we did was that um, we did not carry out the complete, I mean, the necessary studies. Like, for example, the aggregate technical and commercial loss. We are supposed to have carried out the aggregate technical and commercial loss scientifically before we put up the distribution companies for sale. You have to understand that the distribution company are the cow cash cow. If the distribution company don't, didn't, the, uh, doesn't generate the money that is required uh, by transmission and themselves and the generation, uh, uh, there's no way you can move forward. So we have this bulk trader that is uh, guaranteeing everybody distribution are not generating the required fund because uh, most of the companies that came don't have the required capacity. Because when we, when we, when we uh, did Roadshow, we were told that... Uh, 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 we are not going to get uh, the required companies that have experience and capacity to run the discourse. So we know they are not going to come. We lower the qualification criteria, and that's right. how we distributed the companies to ourselves. Now, we don't have capacity to run the, 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 the company. We don't even have the capacity to, 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 to raise the long-term investment. That's required. Nigerian banks, we encourage Nigerian banks to put money there. They put money into it. Now, these Nigerian banks that provided the money to buy the, those discourse are providing money that are short term. They right. are not ideal for this kind of investment and they are very expensive. That is the beginning of the liquidity crisis that we have. So what should we do? And we've seen seen Most of uh, the discourse government. now are at... Right, uh, we've seen, now, seen, seen government even intervening now, taking over and sort of handing them over to new yes. investments. So, so, so look, at, look at the problem better. now. Look uh, at, look at the, uh, There's a point I, I'd like to I, raise. I, I agree you. with you, but... Uh, because of yeah. time, there's a point I'd like to raise with you. I mean, if you've cast a shadow of doubt over the promises of these candidates to you know, improve power, 20,000, 25,000 megawatts. You expect that they have advisors who advise them. So I wonder what would be the fate of other promises they have made again in other areas, security and the economy. But speak to this, because you talked about vested interests, Mr. Mohammed. For the average Nigerian out there, they just want to know why we cannot have uninterrupted power supply. And if you say that the power sector is slow, Nigerian would have a record for being slow because we've faced this for multiples of decades. So really, uh, if we have vested interests, what then do we need to do? And I'm talking for the candidates now, if they will need to ensure that those vested interests are taken care of in whatever way, such that Nigerians, businesses who need this power can have uninterrupted power supply. Thank you very much. Um, I want to inform you that um, two of the major political parties are actually send their manifestos to me and ask me to review. And I reviewed and I also shared it with some experts. And uh, we advised them on what to do. And, um, and one of the things that uh, we told them is that, first of all, uh, given the level of vested interest and the level of decay in the power sector, the president has to be the champion. Whoever is going to be the president has to be the champion. And he has to know the power sector from day one. So that when he enters power, he has the knowledge. Not after entire power, he wants to have the knowledge. Because when, once he made the mistake of entering power without the knowledge, uh, vested interest will cloud him. He will not be able to see people who will be able to advise him. So that is one. So he has to know, have a significant knowledge of the power sector and, uh, from day one. And he has to be the champion of the power sector. The second, yes, uh, the second issue that needs to take place is that the president needs to understand that the power sector is not like other sector. Other sector like uh, road and uh, uh, other things, you can actually do corruption and still be able to do something on that, on, that, on that sector. Let me give you an example. If you are building a road from here to Kaduna and the road is nine inches, you can decide to reduce the, the, the size from nine inches to seven or four inches. You will build the road. People will see road and people will apply the road. Whether the road will last for four years, three years, is another matter. For electricity, if you remove anything or reduce anything, it will not work. And we have examples all over the place. We have built several lines that, uh, if you look at the Ikote Bene, uh, Ogwaji, Joss line, as the MD of TCN was, uh, when I was appointed, I had to do what we call emergency procurement of uh, reactors because there was no reactor. So when you didn't put all those things, they will not work. So it means that uh, the president have to have the belief that uh, 
he is not looking for money from the power sector. Because if you are chasing money in the power sector, they are, you can't make progress. That is one. Secondly, the president needs to take a decision on what to do to rectify the problem we created during the privatization. For example, I heard that they said they want to, they gave matching orders, BP gave matching orders to discuss to, to, sell, to, to sell quickly. But what are they selling? Are you selling a company that doesn't have EPT? What is the experience of North South that bought Abuja Disco? Where are they? Where is the money they put in that Abuja Disco? So when you are selling a company that doesn't have good balance sheet, doesn't have equity, what are you doing? So we, have, we cannot do the same approach we did at that time to solve the problem that we, we, we created. The problem we have is lack of investment into the sector and lack of managerial capacity. We need companies that have managerial capacity, not Yuji Mohamed and Co, who has not run anything, to come and uh, take over the discourse. We also need companies that have balance sheet, that have experience. But of course, there are certain things that government need to do. Government need to resolve the problem of uh, the, shortfall, uh, the, 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 the difference between the market shortfall and the tariff shortfall. We have to agree, and if government is going to issue regulatory instrument to that, that is fine. But the question is that the president have to come up, all the MDAs and all the regulators have to be managed by people who are not only transparent, but they are fearless, they are capable of doing the right thing from day one. Well, there are certainly several components to some of this, including the, what the National Assembly appears to be doing, but I guess those will be for another day. Dr. Usman Mohamed, former managing director of Transmission Company of Nigeria, thank you for coming on this thank morning. Thank you very much. All right, that is the show today. We do thank you all for watching. We'll see you again here tomorrow. I'm Chamberlain. So have a good day. Thank you. I'm Mao Pelgun Yusuf. And we've seen your mails and messages, uh, apologies, but definitely we appreciate them. I'm Kaido Hikyoru. Hopefully we'll be able to capture a number of them tomorrow. But we do thank you for watching. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo.